谢谢分享。接下来我们是一个对谈的对谈的 session。呃，台湾创意周每年邀请很多的国际讲师，就是希望能够打开台湾创意人的眼界，也启发创新的动能。今天很高兴我们有政府官员到了现场，跟我们一起关注这样子的议题。接下来的半小时，我们由台湾数位政委唐凤来主持，与今年所有的国际讲师，也是创新讲的讲团队进行对谈。我们即将出不一样的火花。那我们是不是先请？我们先到台前上，那我们是不是邀请所有的讲师也来到台前？同样欢迎 J P、Jimmy、Julie， 还有明天会来跟我们分享的 We Believers 的共同创办人 Gustavo 跟 Marco 一起来到台上。The ladies first. To be here, uh, not as you know, digital minister, just as thanks uh, to all of your work. Uh, I'm technically digital minister in charge of social innovation, and we see a lot of the common themes that we're uh, pushing forward in the social innovation plan here in Taiwan on uh, sustainable development, on uh, empowering the people, on uh, working with people, not for the people, and things like that. So, first of all, and thank you for all your work. Um, and uh, so, I'm actually given a list of questions <laughs> and uh, so we will um, do the sequence uh, from maybe my line uh, and then the um, six pack <laughs> uh, and, and then uh, over to you but feel free to uh, add on each other's message if you think that uh, you have something echoing or you have further questions based on my questions uh, to, to ask if that's okay with you if it's okay with people then we'll start um, yeah, we were, we were just talking about uh, my line. It's one of those um, ideas because I worked with uh, Toko to write chatbots in the year 2000 and then afterwards with the Siri team uh, for six years. But that idea never occurred to me, maybe because I engaged with smartphones for so long. <laughs> the, the, the simple idea of just having a phone line uh, to serve as a portal to the internet like, completely eluded <laughs> the, the idea. And so, did the idea come from the people in the field, or did you, you know, discover it? And how have uh, it been working in Colombia? Like the impact of, of the either people-led or I don't know Google-led innovations have been working in Colombia. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. It's an honor to be sitting with these amazing guys. Actually, these are like my role models in the industry, so I'm feeling a little bit nervous. But the, the thing about my life is the, the idea came out from two guys, the junior guys from the agency, who uh, their parents are still using legacy phones. So we didn't realize that, I mean, we know that there are still people using all devices in Colombia, but we didn't realize how uh, different it is to have a smartphone that we close. Actually, we all have, uh, I think so, a smartphone but instead of those who are still using these devices. So uh, they realized that those guys, those people are still uh, missing the internet access because of this, this technology. So uh, it was very simple at the beginning. Uh, it has a lot of challenges to make it real, especially working uh, in partnership with Google. Uh, Google is very uh, an amazing company in the world, but at the same time, it's very bureaucratic in many ways. Uh, so uh, we, 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 at the beginning, when we saw the idea, it was, uh, as I told you, very simple. But the challenge was to to to, to make it happen. Especially to get the number, specific number to uh, to link what Google does with what my life is going to do, because we, we were it was very easy to explain to the people if we uh, coordinate the, the words of Google words and the number that, that has my name. Uh, that was one of the main challenges. And then uh, we bring the president of Colombia to join us. We we've been working with them for a long time for the peace process. Uh, and he uh, believed that bringing internet to Colombia, increasing the internet penetration in Colombia, was one of the key uh, tasks in order to to unite 
what is happening right now. We've been separated and divided for a long time, so internet could be an amazing tool to connect each other around all over the country. And uh, uh, so he joined us in the project under the Ministry of Telecommunications and, and Information. Uh, so that's the best. For, for that moment, when we, when we just came to the palace and just presented the, the first call to the president, he was a little bit impressed that we were still very, the, the divide were still not very archaic. So the challenge uh, for that moment was to, to develop the software behind that, which is probably one of the, what happened in the agencies uh, is that we are very emotional at the beginning. So we have great ideas, but we never imagine or realize how come, what is happening later. Uh, uh, so obviously we are not engineers, we are just creatives and, and planners and what is the roles that are in our agencies. So we missed a lot of the steps of the process. We had to learn a lot of things, uh, how to buy a number, for example, how to connect a Google Assistant with the call service, uh, and many other challenges. So uh, for that moment we presented to the president there was still in a beta version, and, and, and then Google came to us and just opened the APIs that they have uh, totally free for the, for the Google Assistant, and that's how more uh, my line came to, to life. Now I, uh, my line is focused in specific regions of Colombia, because when we just released the video, we didn't realize the answer coming from the Colombian, they were so excited, so the, the line collapsed with the number of people calling. So right now it has a specific amount of numbers uh, of, call, of calls at the same time, uh, and it's focused in specific regions of Colombia. And we are also bringing different data, not only the data from Google Assistant. We are bringing the data that people care in those regions, especially people who live in the country side. So for example, Prices, prices from the potatoes, vegetables, fruits that they are selling all the day, uh, so they can track uh, how are they going to sell the, the, the products in the in the, in the markets. Uh, or also um, uh, information about the population where they are living, because uh, we have our statistic uh, institution in, in Colombia, but they don't use to uh, check that kind of information now. They are having this this new information accessible to them. So my land have changed during the time since the moment we bring the idea, or those, those guys came with the idea, until now, what is happening right nowadays. And, and we are moving on for the next phase of my land, which is going to be uh, uh, accessible for the whole country, and probably uh, with uh, accessible in English and Spanish, because the Google Assistant works better in, in English than, than any other language. So what is, this is what we are facing right now, and also to make a free, a, a free call. Now it's, it's a free call, that's a regular call. So if I, uh, just to recap, so in the current phase, uh, people just ask what's on Google, but they will very soon be able to ask about today's milk price or vegetable price. Yeah. But when people start asking that, of course, the long the call will be longer <laughs> than, than the usual. And so you're making like working with telcos to make the call free. Yeah, the, the, w there are two different challenges for my line. One of them is that we are not uh, using machine learning in this process because we're converting voice into data and data goes to the Google Assistant and going back to the answer. And during that process inside our software we are not, uh, for example, profiling the people to get them the best answer as possible. So that's one of the main challenges. And the other one is to bring the telcos uh, as part of the project uh, so they can make it obviously free obviously, uh, and also uh, accessible to the rest of the of Colombia, but there are different. One is more political, and the other one is more technical. Yeah. Well, but they seem surely like you know too successful <laughs> to to like crash uh, the existing. <laughs> um, these are good problems to have. Yeah. Also, the problem that That's right. Um, so, any of you have any other questions to my line uh, before we switch the subject? Or <laughs> anyone from the audience who want to ask anything follow up? There is something that. Like we were talking about, the, you always say that, the, especially when it comes to innovation, uh, personally I really like the ideas that are based on common sense. 
Uh, those ideas, uh, a regular creative would never, ever come up with. In my opinion, are not true marketing creative ideas. You know, like, and what I like about my line is that it seems like it's something that, that you can imagine how they did it. You know, it's voice recognition. It's using all the data that is there. It's one of those things we were talking about. It's one of those things that people think right away, how is it possible that no one did before? And that's the beauty of the good ideas, you know, like, uh, when you come out with something that is a good solution, very simple, you know, easy to explain, mm -hmm. and it's based on common sense and not on something that only a scientist or like a high-level engineer can only develop. And that, that really helps to, to create like a marketing campaign, you know, like it's, it is about, in the end our work is about building brands, that's what, what those kind of ideas generate. You know, like a, a good solution, but a good solution also for, in this case, for the governments and for the people. So that, you know, that is, is a very important thing to say about the idea is what makes it uh, much better, even better. That's a great point. Like, if it makes sense intuitively for the planet, for the people, then it's like automatically resonating with your target audience, and that can kind of organically grow the, the branding as well. Uh, we, we were just talking about, you know, the edible six pack being one of those obvious um, ideas, like in hindsight. <laughs> but um, but sh just to be told, um, how did you initially get the message across? Like, how did you reach? Did you reach for journalists? Did you reach for the social media opinion leaders? Or because the, the message itself is very simple, right? It's part of the sustainable development um, goals and that everybody kind of already identify as important. But the fact that you have a plausible solution to that, that is new. So how did you initially get that message out? I think that uh, it's good to explain the process behind. Uh, basically, these kind of things only happen when you have a true commitment in the cost. You know, uh, this year, I was part of the Sustainable Development Goals uh, category of Ghana in the jury. And among the 900 entries, it was really easy to see those uh, case studies that, that were just meant to, that were created just to win awards. You know, like not, not with a true commitment. Standalone products. Yeah, they were like, those ideas are, and, and it's really easy to see because of some of them are not like good solutions. And, uh, and, and there, there were, for example, a lot of like a crazy amount of entries in, in gender equality, for example, because obviously it's a trend. And I'm sure that a lot of creative think that, that that's an easy way to win awards. And not that much in, for example, the hunger, you know, like zero hunger that it doesn't make sense in my opinion because there are so many brands, food brands, that they would be really easy to come up with a good idea for that sustainable world. But my point is that this idea started with, with a true commitment. You know, like when I sent him the first text message, it was because I was thinking about solutions to avoid plastic. It wasn't about coming up with an idea to win awards. It was about finding a, a, a real solution. Then the next step was to find the perfect partner for it. And in, in a previous session, an agency where I used to work some years ago, I, I did a lot of campaigns for Corona. And Corona would be a perfect client for this. You know, like they, they build their brand around you know, the ocean and you know, like a, a find your reach and stuff. And we were very clear about the point that it should be about like a, it should be a campaign for a small group, you know, for an underdog, a challenge. Someone can challenge the big guys, you know, can challenge the governments, because that, that would be a way easier, a way to, to encourage people to support us and to get all the press out. Especially and, and craft breweries are already a community, right? So it's already a very tightly needed community uh, between them. So it was also another way to say, well, let's tap into 
a community that is already organized uh, and that could work as the underdog. And, and especially a craft brewery that uh, in Southern Brewery is from Florida that target our surfers you know, and fishermen. And so it was a perfect craft, you know, like a craft brewery and, uh, from Florida. So then it was really easy to, to start, you know, like uh, igniting the fire because we, well, not that easy, but, but it worked. Uh, we didn't have any media dollars. We are a small agency, you know, like an independent agency. We don't, obviously, we don't have a PR team behind a PR agency. So it was uh, the two of us and a creative director writing one by one, you know, like emails. We did first, like, a handwriting list of media. Like, we want handwritten to emails? Yeah, yeah, writing emails one by one. We, we selected the First, we selected the millions that we want to reach. Then, what was a, the, a specific editor that, uh, that writes about sustainability or ocean conservancy or whatever it is against plastic? And we sent one by one 65 emails, 60 plus, 60 something. Emails saying, hey, uh, Emily, we love your article about the turtles in the Caribbean Ocean. Please check this video that, that we think that could be interesting and tell us what you think. Send with the link. Then and add in one by one. And they answer right away and they publish, you know, like a case study. And in five days it became the, the most viral campaign, the, the brewing uh, advertising history. So that was the beginning of the process. Right away, you know, like a lot of crap ways and even the big ones reach out to us. And uh, that's the story of the last two years. We're still developing a lot of things and growing and investing a lot of money, but uh, that is, is something that we feel really, really, really proud of. But it sounds great. So, first, have a purpose driven like, mission mm -hmm. and not settle for you know one uh, award or another award, but really make it a mission and then find people who share the same mission. And and the, what, what I was saying about the common sense, you know, like uh, the, the diverse experiences, and another example of the same thing I was telling you about my life. At the beginning, uh, I was ignorant enough to think that the, the solution would be to, create, to build, to create the, the six part rings by using combo, you know, like seaweed. And, uh, because I, I am not conscious as well. And I said, you know, like it's as easy as making six holes and that's it, and it would be the perfect food for fish. Then we realized that, that it would never work. You know, like uh, that, that it would not be resistant enough. Once you take the seaweed from the ocean, it, it gets dry and it's it really easy to break. Uh, and on top of that, on one hand, we will, you know, like feed animals, but at the same time, we will steal their food from the ocean. <laughs> so it didn't make sense. But the, the essence of the idea was simple common sense. You know, instead of killing them, we will feed them. With seaweed, with barley and wheat, with sugar cane, with whatever it is, edible, biodegradable, compostable, resistant enough to hold the cans. But that was the idea. You know, it's something that fishes can eat and don't kill. This sounds common sense, exactly as you said, but um, it, it really is a powerful message. So about your project, which we just heard about, um, are there anything you would like to share um, about either the you know, um, impact that you wish to make in the mid to long term? And or you know, how do you phrase or frame your purpose to people who just you know, hear about this and think, oh, it's a common sense for the first time with the follow-up message that you have? So I, I mentioned it a little bit during the presentation, but the literacy rate for the visually impaired was very shocking because when we first developed the watch, we thought that everyone could read and write. But turned out that 90% um, didn't have the opportunity, didn't have ways to, 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 learn, how to learn Braille. And when I visit like developing countries like India, um, and you really go to those schools and organizations, 
the problem is that yes, it's expensive, but it's also it's also because the government has been continuously subsidizing these products, when there's no subsidy, people don't move themselves. And, and, and so our main objective when we do visit different countries, like for example, I'm here in, in Taiwan, so uh, is to first, we have to figure out, is there like a scheme or a, like a subsidy program that, can, that we can introduce our product through. For example, in Korea, the dot watch is already um, enlisted in the, in the sub subsidized category. So if you have a certain income, the, the visually impaired people, they can get the product for such a like, small amount of price. And, um, but we, as a Korean startup, it's very difficult to do that without meeting people like you. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I um, it, so it was it's definitely a really big opportunity for me to have come here at this moment, like telling the, the, the situation because not a lot of people know. We we even didn't know about the, the literacy rate, and that's why we made the dot me to address our midterm. And you were asking about mid to long term goals. Our mid. Uh, term goal is to bring up the literacy rate to 30% and in the long run, because right now it's 10% in developed countries like the US and UK, but if you, go, if you really go to developing countries, it's like less than 2%. Yeah. And so, and in the long term, we want to eradicate the literacy completely. So, and, and that's, I think, um, as very important for our survival as well as, you know, the greater good. Definitely. I mean, all the countries committed to eliminate, eliminate illiteracy by 2030, so yeah. <laughs> we would better start exponentially. <laughs> Do you have anything to add to the message? Well, um, in 2016, when I met that first time, I was, first of all, very shocked that uh, for the last 40 years, the blind people uh, have not get benefited out of uh, the technology for example, that we are uh, using our smartphone every day. And uh, they were using this kind of old machine, uh, very big, and uh, it's like a five thousand dollar, like she presented, very expensive. And I was a secondly very shocked in Korean market specifically that we cannot buy it uh, if we are not ignored uh, to the government subsidiary. So there are a lot of legal problems either, you know. And then the third problem, the third issue, I was really shocked was that. Um, a lot of people are losing their sight when they are uh, like a later, you know, accident. And then when uh, we are getting old, like it's, it's, it's like uh, our story, ourselves, you know, when I'm getting leached, like uh, when I'm getting 50 years old, something happened to my eyes and I can lose my sight anytime, you know, so it can happen to anybody, which I didn't know. And, and a lot of people, like she said, that, uh, who lost the sight right on after the birth, they cannot leave the brains because it's pretty difficult to learn. And there are not so many uh, like a support from the government and society. And especially also the children, like also uh, studying in the school, elementary school, I was very shocked that they cannot learn the mathematics because the existing Braille device does not provide a multiple calculation plus and minus. And then uh, whereas our that pet is uh, providing active Braille technology, the children at the school at only age they can learn the um, mathematics, and out of this, they can learn the programming. They can be a developer and program right on, rather than just being a massage or a blind people can have a very simple job. You know, they cannot function as a normal person in the society. So at the end, you know, uh, not because it's our product, but you know, it's because uh, there has been no technology development and support for these people. And uh, what we think is that we really have to. Um, like get in touch with this you know, world and then try to be more uh, like uh, interested and support for this problem. So this is what I felt actually personally and uh, maybe what uh, you would actually hear this story first time that there are this kind of news and information, you know. So this would be something, you know, the learning point that I learned out of this, you know, case.
Yeah, I think uh, mathematics above maybe nine years old uh, level is a really a challenge uh, for all the seeing and hear people. Like sending square roots or fractions through my mind will be very, very difficult for formulas. Um, and so some kind of um, spatial uh, display, I think, is essential um, to, to bring the literacy uh, to not just literacy, but actually numeracy as well, which is part of the sustainable development goals. It's not just to eradicate the literacy, but also uh, in numeracy um, as well. So I think this is a great. Um, because of time, uh, we are going to ask each of you to maybe share anything that um, comes to your mind uh, with the audience here. It could be about what you um, have heard or learned um, during your journey toward your uh, working for good, or any tips or tricks <laughs> that you would like to share with fellow creatives, or really in anything really. Um, so Santa, let's start with you, if, if it's okay with you. Or if it's too short enough, notice, we can start from the other way around. I think my answer will be the shortest because I'm not uh, from the creative agency side, I'm from the startup side, so... Um... <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. Uh, I, I, I guess I don't think it's in my position to give tips or tricks, but um, what we do is we look for you know opportunities. And when there is one, we go for it. And, and when we do that, you have to be like a startup to be like brave about it because it's it's not easy uh, doing that so maybe the creative industry is like this i'm not sure um, but whatever you guys are doing you know in korea we say hi team yeah so yes, we say it here as well i think that's a great message i would say uh, like we see my line and all these you know six packs and also that case in my case you know uh, I think thinking about it, we can dream anything about it, but um, most of the times these days, executing it, you know, realizing it, and being the brave, brave one, it's okay to fail, you know, and uh, for several, we didn't know how to work with that, and then we had a lot of struggles, sometimes we, we, had, we, had a, we needed patience, sometimes our internal people say, what are you doing, and are you doing the NGO, blah, 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 and of course we didn't start. Because to get a gold and gold lions, I never thought about myself getting the gold lions, you know, and consecutively in innovation category 2016-18, we didn't do it for the like you know for the glory or anything else. But however, I think being brave and then just do what you believe, I think this is really important. You know, it's okay to fail, but try first and see where you had go. You know, that would be the message from my side. That's a great message. Uh, well, um, the thing is, for example, the, the country where I come from is totally different than Korea or America that you come from, or even they are Latins like me. But the, uh, what we've seen is that there are still a lot of needs out there, there are a lot of issues out there, and we believe in our agency that our talent as a creative has not been only focused on building huge brands instead of putting exactly talent that we have, it's only passion that we have for, for doing a great spot, a great spot in order to, to bring new solutions to, every, to all those things that are happening out there uh, in, in, in our communities, in, in people's lives. Uh, sometimes it sounds uh, kind of romantic and, and I know we have to pay the bills uh, at the end and I'm not talking about doing pro bono just for fun, I'm talking about going out there looking for those opportunities that, that Jim is saying. And um, bring solutions in, in from, from the core of your business. Uh, I think it's part of our duty as creatives. Uh, we, for example, in the agency have the same numbers of NGOs. We support the same numbers of NGOs that the same number that we have, the, the client that we have. Not because we want to win awards, actually. We have awards, we have won awards as a result of our uh, work that we have done, if you come to the agency, you will not see any wall full of lines or anything like that. We just actually, we don't keep the lines, we just give it to the clients. Uh, they are the ones who want to, actually, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, because we don't, have, we don't want to be following this, this, this part of the industry. We, we like them, of course, we like to, to win. It's part of, it's part of the, the, the fancy thing too, of being here. 
and uh, but, uh, but as a result, we believe that has to be a consequence, not the, the core of our business or the core of our uh, passion. Uh, so uh, I will push you to to believe that our industry has an enormous power uh, into society. For many years, advertising has been seen like the the devil, like we brainwash the people to sell products and convince them to buy something that they don't care. But in the other hand, we have ideas like these ones, like dot, like uh, the, the six pack, like bringing from the same kind of uh, people, but understanding that uh, there's something happening, right? Not only in many, in many different uh, edges. So, so that's probably will be will be my message. That put all the effort you are doing every single day, try to bring uh, as much as ideas as possible to solve what is happening in our society. It's a great and transformative message on this extent. Uh, two very simple things. Uh, well, our relationship is called We Believers, and, and it's based on the idea that when you truly believe on something, good things and people follow. And that's kind of key for every single project that you do. If you truly believe on something, you know, like people follow and support you, and that, that's kind of key. And in connection with that, uh, I, I use a phrase that I was planning to use in, in, the, in the presentation tomorrow, but when it comes to innovation that is about the sustainable goals, for example, it's, it's really important to have a true commitment with, with the cause. Because this is not about lions, it's about you know, like the polar bears, it's about whales, it's about animals in China, it's about the food that we eat, it's about the air that we breathe, you know, like a common ground for the future generation. So it's kind of key to have that, that kind of commitment before uh, we come out with an idea and we do the whole effort that it takes right after that. That's great. Uh, two things to close. Uh, I would say that absolutely you need, when you're, when you're messing around with innovation, you really need to make sure that you have that commitment and passion for that solution and that problem. Why? Because you're going to fail many times, because you're going to face a lot of challenges, a lot of hurdles, and those hurdles and those challenges, when you surpass them, they're going to make your idea better. Uh, an example for us was, the initial idea was to make the edible six-pack greens out of seaweed. And the second thing that was very important is you really need to be humble, right? Humble to know that only with the people in your agency is not going to be enough in innovation. You're going to have to reach out to people that know more about the subject than you do, that you respect them and that you trust them. Because that person that we brought in, uh, who is an industrial engineer, uh, he actually pointed us to the thinking that seaweed was probably not the best material, but there were others. And those materials could be the ones that is actually used to produce the beer. You know, some, some of the materials that we use are wheat and barter. That made the initial idea better, right? Uh, so, so making sure that you have that passion, that commitment uh, to go after the hurdles is really critical because you're going to face many, and they're going to make your idea better. And the second one, truthfully, be very humble. Humble that you are not going to find the answer and the execution and the solution but yourself. Find the people that you trust, find the people that are as passionate as you are, and make them come on board to make sure that you can create this execution and become part of that solution, uh, and hopefully partners in real life. The 27-year-old engineer that we found in Mexico that was starting to toy around with these materials. Today he's 30, and he is the chief operating officer of Edible Six Pack Ring, the company, right? And we are partners with him and his company and another group of investors as well. But because we reached out early on to people that knew more about this specific topic and could bring our idea to life, and that is very very important. Let's I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, you know that uh, in any innovation uh, process, the, the maximum goal is to do something that is good enough that in the end, you know, like the governments support it with, with laws or something like that. In our case, you know, if, if at some point, you know, like uh, 
governments decide to go against plastic with a law, our problem will become much bigger. So what's your message, your advice for the creatives? What's the best way to make that, that thing happen? Like, what, what do we need to do? Okay. I cannot speak for other governments in the world. <laughs> I can only speak for Taiwan. Um, so, um, actually, uh, you know, recently that the Taiwanese government decided to ban the use of the in-house uh, use of plastic straws for a very national identity drink, the, the bubble tea. Uh, and basically, it, it really creates a lot of discussion about alternative materials. There's some seaweeds uh, there as well. <laughs> and, and also, people discover that if you use a spaghetti noodle, it can last a couple hours before softening. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of very innovative materials just being thought. Of course, the traditional solution is just a stainless steel um, straw. But anyway, um, there's just motivated people to, to think but the original push for this um, ban, uh, actually graduate ban uh, on the take out uh, and in-house first, but then take out uh, plastic use, um, is a e-petition. Because in Taiwan, we have an e-petition system where if there's more than 5,000 people countersigning the online signature, the ministries will have to respond. And if it uh, encourages many different ministries, like in this case would be Ministry around Environment, about Economy, and even Transportation and things like that, then uh, the Digital Minister in charge of social innovation, uh, that's me, actually convenes the meeting with the petitioner and all the ministries to make out uh, the idea that our common value to everybody, because every ministry represents a different set of positions, and it's very important that all their stakeholders see where their stakes are, and also figure out some common values that we can then make into innovations that don't leave anyone behind, that satisfies, you know, we call it Pareto improvement, that doesn't sacrifice anyone's values. And so when we meet the petitioner who petitioned for this gradual ban on plastic straws, we found out that she's only like 15 years old, uh, a, a senior um, high schooler, uh, and it's a civic assignment by the civics teacher. Uh, it's like uh, the teacher challenged everybody who are 15 years old in the class to find some message that you think will resonate with 5,000 people and make it a national petition. And I think this is a really good, um, not just a marketing thing, because if you joined the uh, e-petition, of course you're going to spread the message, but after we figure out a gradual plan to uh, reduce plastic waste and so on, we now have advocates who can just speak for this message because people feel that they co-created the policy themselves. It is not something that the government imposed on them, but rather people from various different industries committed to this coordinated action and say, you know, if we are in this together, we can do the innovation together. I think the government's role in this case is just to facilitate and bring people's values together into something that is sustainable. So if you want to start a petition or a referendum, even in Taiwan, we have all the direct democratic uh, tools to do that, but that's just for Taiwan. And we're actively exporting these thoughts and technologies to other governments as well. So they see internet as not as a cacophony, but also something that people can co-create. So that would be my answer. And that is a great point, you know, finding in our case, it was finding that common public enemy, right, the plastic ring. But everyone had seen the photo of the turtle with the plastic ring around deforming the body, right? And all of a sudden, there was a solution that seemed really plausible and common sense. And we were very open at the beginning that this was an opportunity that could happen, right? I mean, from that initial text to when we actually did the first prototype, it was eight weeks. But from those eight weeks of the first prototype to the mass scale of the edible six-pack ring, it took three years, right? But what was good is that we showed people who were open to say, there is an opportunity. This can happen. And then they're willing to give you a chance if you're open about Yes, that's community building through transparency and also early participation and humility, very importantly. So please give our speakers a round of applause. And thank you all for your contribution. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
uh, may we have all the speakers and uh, Audrey all together to have a photo together on stage? Okay. So, <laughs> 工作人员麻烦撤下椅子，我们在台上拍一个合照。